Hello everyone. Today's talk is titled Catalysts for Human Consciousness. And so when we look at reality, we see it in many ways. We see how we are focused and what is really significant in our understanding. Because when we understand something, it's as if we're standing under something to perceive it. But actually, when you begin to see that your observance and sense of being here is actually transcendental, it means that the transcendence is not uh, uh, the, the next cool chapter of your story. It means that every moment is kept within a more profound view. And so this vision is very important because if you cannot see clearly in this life, you will feel that incapability is your only reality. The problem is that humanity must now enhance and in a sense increase in its existential confrontation through self-awareness into seeing that the human phenomena is as changing as much, of the, as, much as the world around you. Every thought, every human being being born, everything present and everything that you are aware of is significant to you. And if you ignore its significance by thinking that you're only one part of this vast moment of being that you are, uh, you will see that incapability will be shaped that thought, shapes that thought they could never be changed. It's very important to see that uh, the catalyst for human consciousness begin when an authentic and natural approach is taken. You begin bringing yourself back, not to in being someone, not to into a certain act. You are taking yourself to a moment in your awareness, and let's say in a moment in your memory, where you were honest. You are utilizing just that moment, that significance, that contribution, and with that imagery, you are perceiving who you are. You see, it is not a measured thing. That is why there's no incapability at first. I, 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 not at first. At first there is a sense of incapability, but then there is, uh, there is no incapability afterwards. You begin seeing that uh, life is uh, playfully and magnificently accurate. So you may think that your projections are wrong. You may think that you have just lost something. But you have simply lost an aspect of your interpretation because all your interpretation is mainly coming out of external reality. So where, can, where else can man understand himself if externality is his own separation? So you see when you close your eyes and you perhaps sit in that meditative pose as many yogis and mystics have in the Himalayas, you begin seeing that your environment is important because your environment is at first identifying who you are. If I begin trying to think, let's say if I, if I go in an environment where there are many people arguing and I just begin to think, guess what? It's, <laughs> I'm going to be arguing with myself even if I begin taking it. But once you begin seeing that Thought is not something that is you, it is something you're just aware. You begin understanding the fabulous intelligence that you perhaps see in a river in nature, similar in your abstract realms. If your abstract realms are not based on the reality that is here, your sense of multidimensional exploration or self-observance into what you actually are and in finding this here within will become a bit uh, segmented because segmentation is trying to find out how it, the individual is trying to find out how it's collective, but the individual, it's not a, lo a linear knowing. Do you understand this? It is not just a series of thoughts that, oh gosh, I did it, I hit the note. No, no, no. It's that your whole being and your whole observance is dissolving into the observance that brought you here in the first way. Man is right now as a multidimensional being or the human consciousness is realizing that he, ha in his abstraction, he has the ability to be creator. And so perhaps that is how we're examining our ancient texts. Religion is never the same religion because each person has their own interpretation of what life means. And because everything in life is different, because you are observing the difference within you, you see that that there is no, no judgment that uh, is accurate. Judgment is only accurate if we're objects. If you're objects, of course you can judge it as much as you want, but when, you, when we are self-aware beings, when we are not objects, when we are, uh, we are the cosmos existing and then a sense of inhuman consideration of it, you begin to see that it's time to take existential responsibility for what you are perceiving. It is time to explore this holographic universe if you see that there is more to it. So the fact that there is an unknown aspect to the fact that there could be unknown dimensions to your experience is something that you need to find. Because there is no perfect guru here, guys. No one can be as certain as you are of your existence.
do you know? No one can completely know what you want because the need, the longing is, in, is coming from a greater sense of collective knowing. It's coming from more of a sense of multidimensionality. In other words, your inspiration doesn't seem like gosh, it's as if I can't put it in space and time, but I'm inspired by something. So you begin seeing you're inspired by simply the intelligence of the observer rather than the object you're trying to think that it's the observer. And so that's why clarity becomes how you go through your own trials and errors to see that there was never any mistake. And then you were never mistakenly taken somewhere or put somewhere. The, the, it's just that existential responsibility, dis, existential responsibility and existential allowance dissolve the, the prisons that ideology keeps because you are realizing and you're centering yourself by the nature of how everything is flowing rather than the nature of how you use structure that's been used before. Do you know, it's that moment where, you know, perhaps the, uh, the student of architecture looks at how his uh, father was an architect and his grandfather was an architect and it just suddenly begins to see that they've been doing the same designs, you know. It's like, for example, his, his grandfather made a house, you know, and his, so his father made the same house but more floors. Let's see, that was the amount of advancement. And so you see, suddenly the new generations are like, why such old structures when my vision is showing uh, such, uh, let's say, um, transparently clear ones. So what that really means is that the greatness in architecture becomes how something from this chaotic world can be interpreted for you in, in your new sense of interpreting your own linearity. So the moment I begin considering I'm a human being, guess what? Everyone, I, I begin seeing an idea of a human being in every person rather than seeing every person is a very powerful phenomena that is unspeakable. What that means is if I begin uh, talking about you as if I know you, guess what? I don't know you. And so similarly, when we hear conversations or when we believe something, it is not something found from direct experience because direct experience, you don't need to believe it. You know whether the store is open or not because you've been there, you know the store, you know the hours. But if you don't, then you, you'd stand in front of that coffee shop or you'd act as if you know, but you don't know anything. And so the problem with acting or trying to take beliefs that you have not really understood or experientially absorbed will be like, you, the problem will, it's kind of funny. You will confront the nature of the illusion that you have accepted to be real for you. So what that means is we see that in Islam, uh, it's as if men at that time were doing idol worship. They were, they were bringing shapes in front of them. They're like, this is my God. No, no, my God has more feathers than yours. You know, so my God is more God. Than you. So this is how they were thinking. It was separated. Their understandings of their collective was individual. They were each having their own separate gods and they were like, we're doing a higher power. So it was that moment where there was an integration and in attitude. Islam uh, right now is being acknowledged as some religion, but back when it was present, it was a huge movement in human consciousness. It's as if one person stood there. Do you believe it? One man went up to other people who were worshiping their gods. Do you know? There's no more serious relationship. And he's like, there is one. These idols are not your actuality. And so it was as if the collective was speaking honestly. And that is the greatest responsibility of anyone who finds himself to be an intermediary or some form of prophetic communicator. Because a prophet is not himself. He does not exist. The messenger of God does not exist. The intermediary is only kept for the individual. For the collective needs no intermediary. In other words, we only draw in our paintings angel wings. But light was everywhere. And so conception and how you take uh, form uh, and observe the geometry that is the transition of your whole being, you will see that the formless observance is a vast openness. Do you know? It's like, it's like uh, again, as I have said many times before, if you were aware of a room, you standing in the middle of a room, imagine the whole room being aware of you. Now imagine there not being walls. Because in your subtler planes, there's more existential allowance. So what that means is when I sit down and contemplate, a uh, man has an ability, your human mind has an ability to take you to the ends of the tunnels of chaos and also has an ability to take you into the tunnels of order. And so your mind has an ability to bring man's greater structure in your own way of seeing chaos. 
And so that is when genius blooms because you are paying existential sensitivity, you're paying attention to an existential sensitivity, a range of existence that people are not seeing. It is as simple as living more mindfully. So that Zen master, uh, people thought, oh, look, he's a guy who just, you know, he didn't, he didn't go to school. You know, we can't, we can't, you know, trust his, his wisdom. You know, many people think that way. But if you see what he's saying, his presence shows you that by simple mindful awareness to your breathing, you maintain your realness in your abstract and subtler planes. So what that means is your experience of multidimensionality becomes much more real when there is emptiness and the externality that is keeping the dualistic relationship. And so right now I am talking about these in a structured way, but this can come to you in an instant, in a moment. You don't need words for this understanding. It's as if it's a vision, a revelation communicates more. It's like when Noah, Noah was having a normal day, you know, and then suddenly one day he slept and he just had this profound experience in his dream set and he woke up, he's like, okay, gosh, I can't, I can't go pick up berries anymore. I got I, I, a new reality is open to me. It was so real for him that he continued. And so this is where faith is important because faith is where man, uh, uh, in, his, in his change of externality, trusts that he will remain. And that trust must come from, again, an existential self-awareness. So you sitting down, perhaps very calmly and gently and just, uh, not giving compassion a shape, not trying to help anyone, not trying to do anything, just sitting down and just being present, learning to be with your environment. And as your breath harmonizes you, you see that your heart has not just been beating, it's always been teaching you a lesson. It's always been, like, regardless, buddy, how much you think that the idea will survive, how much you think that even this person who's desiring things is lost in his, in his, in his cycle of wanting things he can't have, you will see regardless of your interpretation of conception, the origin of awareness in an instant shake things in the sense that your self-communication on an individual level is showing you how you were always present in the collective knowing. So in that silent moment when you're sitting on the grass, you know, or when that yogi is sitting down, when that Zen master is in his meditation, it is not that he is acting. It is that he is dissolving his experience. He's telling you consciousness is not, it does not need borders. And so when we see that our nations are, are present to and as consciousness, there is then uh, an understanding that language was never the dictator. <clears throat> and so dictation was even never the intermediary. Dictation was just another form that was giving you direct experience which you uh, were not confronting. So existential confrontation means sitting down and that Zen master, you might think he's sitting down but there has been times in the mystic's eyes where in his love for the unknown he has broken his ideology. And as he has broken his ideology, his presence has displayed what he has always known. And so in the transparency of ideology, there is the transcendental awareness of how awareness is found where it is. And so complexity, just like an infinity sign, quickly goes and comes back to simplicity, which is the center. And so this line is constantly moving and you see that eternity meant that, wow, man thought eternity was just something he'd understand after death. No, uh, human ability is reaching points where it's like, it's not just an eternity on a computer dimension where, gosh, the computer can calculate till infinity. It's eternity in the way where human communication is now uh, being utilized again. It's as if it's coming back. The patterns of before are coming back to now calibrate. So what that means is we think there's history. No, it's actually movements and rivers. It's these multidimensional rivers of ideology where they're constantly moving. And so it's very unspeakable, but very profound if you trust life to let you, let, for, if you trust life, uh, so then life will trust you to show it. You, the most important thing that the advanced communicator requires and the power of consciousness requires is an immense trust and trust in life. Guys, this is not just some fluffy, fluffy um, uh, family value talk. This is very important to see that compassion is important for your transcendental uh, alchemy. 
Do you know, it's important for how consciousness moves. So what that means is we have people such as heart surgeons or doctors who take care of the physical body. Now we also need people and it, it, those, this is in, a, in essence who the gurus are and they have been both in Tibet and ancient India and in many places where meditation has grown. You will see that it's, it's as if uh, they are there to show you the presence that you are, which is unspeakable, unshapeable, but then is there uh, to, how would I say it? They are simply there. It's as if they have realized something you will realize and, and, and you know how you grow up. So what that means is the guru is simply a more self-aware being. That's simply it. And so you are looking at his self-awareness and seeing, gosh, why am I not that self-aware? And suddenly you are becoming self-aware in an instant of your existential allowance. So the guru is never working for anything because he is situated transcendentally. Those that are very authentic and those that do not go to anyone. Life comes to them. So what that means, it becomes one of those moments where you close your eyes in complete emptiness and open your eyes and any fullness you are, you are lo lovingly receiving. Compassion is becoming a tool for a, a, a great technology for existential confrontation because it allows to integrative realities for you to recognize the nature of your being. So it, it moves you into greater flows of how this plane of existence is navigating. So the pilot of consciousness uh, will immediately see that as he goes to any environment, his body will align. So your intuition is there and you see that, trust me, we as individuals, uh, we as human pe uh, beings who observe the human experience, love the human experience. Regardless of how that guy looks like, what his religion is, we just love the human experience. So what that means is if we were all human beings and something tried to bother the human experience, all human beings would be like, get out of here. This is not, this is not your uh, environment. Do you know, because we are all so lovingly, compassionately seeing the clarity and the profound uh, platform that this humanity is. You don't understand. Collective uh, consciousness is when different individuations come to be present in the same experience. When that happens, profound things happen. So what that means is perhaps you, you maybe saw that uh, wild man, that spiritual dervish back in the day, just go into an ecstatic dance. And he'd go into this ecstatic dance where it, for him, he would very playfully tell to others it was out of body, but it was actually a dissolution into the love that is existing. So this, the dervishes, uh, the Sufi path of love, they would whirl. And as they would whirl, it's as if they would whirl beyond their ideology. And so their experience would be greater in that way. And so what that simply shows is that similarly, uh, that moment where the advanced communicator is aware, it is your engagement with your moment of awareness that brings you into a knowing where thought was dust, thought was rubbish technology. You become an intuitive knowing. You, it's as if your energy is kept not no longer just by your idea and like I yo get food, caveman eats food. You know, it, it's suddenly kept by how your self awareness is allowing your life or allowing your bodies to be present. And so it's a very insane thing because for my whole life I was so ignorant to how I was receiving air, to how I was receiving the elements. And so I forgot, I thought it was just, oh, this is it, you know. And so my ignorance took away that I realized, gosh, this existential intelligence is within everything. So me breathing is a communication of form. It's simply a certain image that is kept present. And so I must be aware of that presence to see that I am always beyond the imagery. So what that means is, it's right now it's a very interesting phenomena. It's like the West has been building up and egos have been preserved. It's like life's plan. You know, it's like a planet. It's like, you know, you know if, if Gaia could speak, he's like, wow. It's like, you know, <laughs> it'll probably tell humanity, stop freaking out about your egos. Do you know, it's my plan for you to have an ego. That's why you're made this way, right? And so you would see that it's as if egos are being cultivated and great structures of illusion are being made. Do you know? It's like our whole... Uh, this whole time uh, we've been making egos and we've been arrogant and stuff, we have been doing a valuable contribution, but because we don't understand it, we think it's wrong and bad and, you know, greedy. The dimension of your interpretation is important because if you choose bounds for space and time, uh, the spaceless and timeless will always be a greater view. So you must see that from the acceptance of the emptiness that is within all things, 
we may see then the true value of nothing in no thing. And playfulness, it does not just apply in words, it applies in life. Because if you do not play, you cannot even cultivate the skills. If you don't give yourself, uh, if you're judging yourself in doing things too much, you need to immediately still and silence yourself, silence yourself, not in a way as if like ignore everyone, just go for like 50, 20 minutes in nature and just sit down, close your eyes and make your body completely still and just be alive. Be present and eventually you'll see as you're aware, uh, you'll pay attention to your breathing. And as you do, you begin, in, uh, how do I say it? Making more real for yourself the ability to be the stillness in all the movements that has happened. So what that means is another, let's say perhaps, uh, catalyzing effect that meditation has is that let's say throughout the day in the morning I woke up and gosh, there was some hectic things I had to do and you know, I was late so I had to, you know, uh, eat very quickly and do whatever and do all this stuff, right? So let's say it was a hectic experience, I was rushing. Now, sometime after that, I would probably, what Mr. Within would do is we'll go sit down and be still. Just sit down and simply be present, you know? Just breathe and just be, you know? Don't, don't have any opinions, just simply observe. And you would see that it's as if I'm giving myself a moment to just acknowledge the stillness of the day, not just the hectic movements, and see that that same stillness was present from the morning. So that me thinking that I stumbled in my past is not true because I always had the awareness of the greater ability I could express. So what that means is that you are taking your experience into your direct view. And so direct experience is clarity in a world that's indirectly pointing to the truth. For poetry could never completely show what was in the uh, mystic's eyes. In other words, the unknown is unshapeable, but it, it continues and it is present. The greatest catalyst for human consciousness is involvement and engagement with your plane of existence. So it doesn't matter who you are, what condition you're in, you're right now just acknowledging and engaging your environment and your proximity and even your body you're acknowledging what you have what you are do you know even before bringing in the concept of having things just see what you are to even have something and simply see that okay you you might have a name you might have a form you know you might have an idea but uh, how able is this idea to confront itself beyond itself how able is that person born in front of a mirror uh, able to see that that's a reflection that there's never two of it Clarity comes in our own ability to shake off the meaningless uh, weight that ideas that are not real to us are having on us. So what I mean by that is your beliefs, are they helping you? Or is this, is this just something to talk about? Because if it's not helping you move forward, why carry weight? Why carry ideas rather than go find methods in very accurately uh, uh, being aware of your direct experience and your absolute reality? The concept of an ultimate reality, the ultimate truth, is not one to be taken lightly. It is not one that only belongs to the realm of fantasy and sci-fi. It is one that is directly required. Every idea, every thought of is relevant to now. Everything done in the past has just passed the torch, and if the past could continue to be alive, they would just see what we were through. And it would be a profound experience. It would be that moment where you are the eyes of all your ancestry and all that you can be. And so you will see that it's as if in one lifetime, in this present lifetime, you always knew the greatness that would be carried on by your children because your experience was shared, not as an individual, but as the collective. Bring your complexities to simplicities and problems will dissolve in the sense that you were never in a problem. Ability begins with not having heavy definitions or imagery of your de depression. So if I ask you, are you depressed? And you begin telling me imagery. That's called creation. You're creating it. You're creating your problem with more intense imagery that's real to you. And it, that's the worst thing, actually. 
So what what <laughs> what let's say a thought doctor would say <laughs> quotations, you know, similar to that a surgeon, you know, <laughs> heart surgeon. Uh, you would see, and he would say, stop communicating that which you don't want. Just stop verbally saying it. Stop making it into that sensitivity. All right? And once you stop talking about it, you see it can only remain in your thoughts too much because you're moving throughout the day, you know? It's like you have the most intense problem. You're like, gosh, how can I survive? And suddenly you realize thirsty and you go get a glass of water and you're like, oh my God, for two minutes you, were, you had no idea of your problem because you were just drinking a glass of water, you know? <laughs> two minutes for water is actually, that's, it's probably a lot of water. <laughs> So guys, recognize that fantasy, if you begin like telling yourself that your reality is more than you've actually experienced, uh, it's like you're putting yourself a step back. Don't judge reality just like you won't judge a human being talking to them for, for the first time. And engage and interact uh, with an awareness to your present moment and to the clarity that is found in just self-awareness in just you being aware that you're alive. You being aware that you're breathing, you know? Many people don't appreciate their breath unless you know, they're suddenly in a situation where they feel like they're suffocating. And so it's very, very crucial to uh, allow ourselves to perceive the reality we are seeing now in more deeper and more aware ways. So what that means is, I think many of our problems, you know, in regards to culture and society are problematic because the awareness of the individual and the problem is not seeing where uh, a world where the problem is not there. So fundamentally, you are giving yourself suffering, not in the sense that you're saying, oh, there's, you're giving suffering. It's just that you are a natural life process in which your interpretation must change in the sense that your idea has to make a choice. Your idea has to make a choice whether it just constantly wants to be itself, Bob wants to constantly be Bob, or Bob wants to even observe where the name Bob comes from, more than why the parents even chose, more than why the parents even were here, more than why even the world was here. Wait a minute, more than what else? And that is the seed, that is the search, that is what you need, that is the fruits of the spiritual path. Your spiritual path is not a game. It is that which is pulling you out of the game and so it must be done with utmost honesty. Sincerity, sincerity is your most efficient technology. Sincerity means uh, stopping that which is dishonoring any reality, in a sense, especially yours. When you lie and you, you kind of say, okay, why did I have to lie if I'm a person who's free and comfortable now? And you see, you're lying because your idea thinks that it has a new way to express. Sometimes uh, beings uh, in a developing species are, how would I say it? In a developed species become, they play around uh, and when they play around, they create imageries of loss in which they think they're lost, but they never are. And when I say play around, it means like, uh, think of it this way. Some guy comes and says, this apple is God. Before someone sees it's an apple, imagine some other guy, oh my God, this apple is God. And he shouts, right? But you see, this apple is not God. This apple is an apple, because that's how we're calling it an apple first. But God is the collective observance in which we all bask in. So the presence of the universe, regardless, some people have poetically called it God, some people have poetically called it, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the universe, you know, or in any scientific term. It's one of those things where uh, we must bridge the gap in showing that there's, uh, the differences are okay. But what is not okay is us constantly reacting to how we're different. It's about time for man to acknowledge his fellow man beyond it. So when you're talking to people, you should not even be thinking of saying sexist or racist stuff. You must not think of saying degrading things. You must look at them and acknowledge them, not as just the person you think they are or whatever you think they are, just acknowledging them as life in front of you. 
similar to how you would uh, acknowledge perhaps a tiger, you know, or an elephant. You would just simply acknowledge their presence. And after you've acknowledged their presence, you will eventually get an insight in, in who they are. And then if you have you know, if you have cultivated enough trust in life, you will communicate without thought the most perfect harmonious things because you are not communicating for anyone. You have become the transparent uh, emptiness that is aware of how uh, when the Zen Master's Cup, uh, it, there's tea being uh, The tea is not meant but the tea is kept in the ranch. Yeah. And so we can even see that the water, the tea being poured in the cup, is one sense of intelligence, let's say liquid intelligence, and then the emptiness looks solid, for example. You know, it's as if, like, when we break the atom, it's empty, similar to the Zen Master's cup, which is empty. And suddenly we see that emptiness is kept by a greater intelligence, which is the cup. So the emptiness, our experience of emptiness, is actually the presence of a greater beings in other dimensions. So what, that is how you go through it. Nice. It's oh, nice. <laughs> Who knew a Zen master's teacup was the perfect metaphor to explain multidimensionality? <laughs> So in other words, uh, your acknowledgement of self and how much you see that your sense of self is coming because you're acknowledging others as other. And so once you acknowledge these relationships, you see that, no, you don't need safety. You don't even need uh, a health maintained just in well, like trying to keep one form and going to the gym. You know, Even though going to the gym is, is, is something that you must always have your body and external reality totally functional. You know? So definitely keep health in mind. But you will begin to see that your trust in life will take the advanced communicator through his intuition to a realm where he will learn how to handle his individuality better because he's getting a, get a clearer sense of the nature of reality. Sometimes a clear sense of the nature of reality means, oh my God, this way of thinking, empty. All right, I gotta head back, go back, go back, go back, and suddenly you go back, all right, wh uh, where was I before I, I could speak? What experience do I have before? And suddenly you go back there and you see you have no ideas, you don't know, and that not knowingness was the profundity of your experience there. So what that means is, uh, when I look at my memory, I always remember nothing. But it's very hard to sometimes remember some things. Do you get it? Nothingness is there. And so if, the, if that nothingness becomes your allowance to see beyond the self that uh, is defining the limitation, uh, your individuality was never there uh, in the sense that you see that everything in reality came from internal. Because if you only say you're external, you have no other choice but to confront the other side of the polarity. So there's an internal, but the actuality of the greatness of the advanced communicator and the powers of consciousness is that he becomes his plane of existence. So it's neither side, uh, you're neither creator or creation, you're the observance of all that is, and you are all that is. And so it's similar to uh, the collective awareness or consciousness that you are not an individual in a galaxy. You are the galaxy's intention within an individual. And so, gosh, <laughs> you thought your name was just Bob. I hope that we see that Mr. Within is very gracefully communicating these ideas and is hopefully communicating in a way to inspire exploration, but self-exploration. You know, exploration of who you are and what your abstraction means to you. It is about time. Imagination is, is why is it still uncharted territory? We are conscious, we are self-aware. Our art is getting to a point where it's more creative. We have found tools in altering our consciousness in different ways. And if we have self-awareness, we see that we are simply information in form. And so as we are information in form, our most immediate presence is to be here. So it's not that I should leave here or things should change. External reality is perfect as it is because perfection is undefined. The minute you define a sense of perfection to an, objection, uh, to an objective uh, sense of your external reality, you will begin seeing that, gosh, you have put your truth 
in a realm where the spectrum can infinitely go on. So what that means is all those people who thought in their generation they understood truth, suddenly they realize the next generation is just so much greater in leap of thought simply in their design. We are transcendental beings in the sense that when we observe our being, there's a sense of view of reality, similar to how you're, let's say, in a park and looking at a tree, that you begin to see that all the imagery you're aware of can move in infinite ways in your subtler sense of how existence is kept. So what that means is what, I'm, what Mr. Within is finding is that the human mind and the catalyst for consciousness can also be found present in man's raising ability and his exploration of different states of being. Because I have been in states of being where I have been very incapable and I'm like, gosh, it's suffering. Of course suffering is more when you're incapable, right? But when you suddenly become capable, you realize that the ability came because somewhere in your vision of the world, you saw a, a, a being who could do it. And that is why don't create depression from yourself for yourself and always have the attitude that when you communicate, you're communicating the most significant thing. You're communicating the most purposeful thing. You're not just talking uh, uh, shenanigans. You are talking from your utmost core and clarity and you're becoming an authentic being. You're being a person that you're like, okay, I don't need to change to be somebody. I am, I have a body. <laughs> You know, and some thoughts on this body, but you will see you are a presence. And a being who is aware of his presence is embraced by the universe and the cosmos and the smile of the Heavenly Father in such a way that we begin seeing it's no longer individual beings, but that innately where our intuition is coming from, we are present in a greater experience. So the nature of this aspect of reality is very fascinating because it's as if uh, we are in an experience of a greater collective being. Like it's not an object, it's not empty. There's an intelligence. Think of again the Zen Master's cup being a different intelligence than the liquid, but the liquid is, is being preserved in that emptiness which is of that design. So we're simply similar to even... And this is what I found pr profound in many ancient traditions in the regards that they acknowledge deities. And so deities were, uh, let's say, more collective and able uh, uh, visions of form which man could learn of learn from but you begin to see that it's not that it's just a deity it's just that right now as I'm communicating this communication is happening and the significance of it is how my moment is an existential allowance of any expression so what that means is for me after a certain point of searching my fascination became in my own ideas where do I get my randomness from where do I get my spontaneous ideas from how do I approach my memory Right? These are things that's not really communicated. And so uh, one of the most important tasks of human consciousness is, is to also, after you being catalyzed, you uh, taking the whole wisdom of your whole life, your whole moment of experience, and begin seeing how you can provide that in efficient ways for society and culture. That's it. It's now time to take experience and change that into the proper action that is needed. And, and that action will be one that is aligned with our awareness to the nature. So what that means is that person making factories, that person destroying this shape of this physical life just to get certain forms, is destroying an aspect of his experience. And so when beings destroy aspects of their experience by thinking that they are the rulers uh, in their own measured worlds, that is when there is no longer insanity. There is no longer chaos. You just see beings just walk away from that guy's reality. What that means is that it doesn't matter if it's an apocalypse here. You can still, your experience can go in a more comfortable seat. Uh, so what that means is we are never trapped but if, our, if we are really kept as individuals, then slavery will become something which we feel we don't have control over. Because an individual might not feel as strong as, uh, as the collective knowing. And so the collective knowing means that, trust me, every human being is alive and the same inspiration and urge that is in every being to be present is also in also you. We are a similar phenomena and that is why we are uh, the family, we are a certain family in this modality of how existence has projected life form. 
and our embrace of everything within our moment of being will be the clarity that is observing all. And so the emptiness will communicate the wisdom that we would know in the sense that our actions will be ones where we know. So again, if how would I communicate this? If, there, if it was an apocalypse and let's say you're having your normal day and you, if you were following your intuition and trusting life, you would begin to see that you have such trust beyond, you have cultivated such trust beyond the fluctuations that uh, normally are changing things that when the apocalypse is coming, you are just calmly walking with the flow of what your intuition says. And what that means is you might begin seeing that instead of panicking and running to people, you must become beginning to become very gentle. So your state of being is irrelevant to the, uh, uh, the vertical dimension of your states of being. It's irrelevant to the horizontal expression of, let's say, the, the apocalypse is happening in one projection of your reality. You're a multidimensional being, and so you may follow your intuition to very comfortably walk into your collective knowing before this externality is done. And you can do it in an instant, of course. Every being is able. We, our language right now is the biggest limitation because it's providing imagery that's inefficient. So we must enhance the English language by integrating the beauty of many views in one. And so the greatest catalyst for human consciousness is to observe the life that you are. For then the cosmos will begin to speak in ways where it will clearly hear. And that's when your trust in life will take you to, it's as if you have cultivated such trust in this external view, in this horizontal dimension, that you will see that every single step you took in this life had a vertical dimension. You will begin seeing such profound understanding in your current understanding, and so there's no object lost in a world of objections. But a subject that was so transparent that encompassed everything, the emptiness preserved within greater lights. Much blessings and Namaste.